So welcome to this John Schofield Trust Masterclass. Um, I'm David Stenhouse, I'm the Chief Executive of the Trust, and I'm delighted tonight to be able to introduce you to Robert Moore, ITV's correspondent in Washington, uh, who most recently covered the extraordinary storming of the Capitol on the 6th of January this year, in which uh, thousands of Trump supporters, believing that the election had been stolen from them, actually penetrated into the US Capitol in an attempt to overturn uh, the election. Um, we're going to see a little bit of Robert's report in a minute, but let me do a little bit of housekeeping as you take your virtual seats. Um, tonight, if you have questions, and I know that many of you will, please put them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your, uh, your screen, uh, and I'll see them and I'll be able to introduce them uh, as we go along. Um, but uh, first of all, let's have a little look at Robert's report from the Capitol that day. We followed the aggrieved and infuriated Trump supporters as they stormed the building. I swear to see it here, and they just said he's dead. Through broken windows and doors they had forced open. And for a few heady moments they felt they had won a precious victory. of the Congressional Building. What's the purpose of storming Congress itself? Because they work for us. They don't get to steal it from us. They don't get to tell us we didn't see what we saw. We respect the law. We were good people. The government did this to us. We were normal, good, law-abiding citizens, and you guys did this to us. We want our country back. We are protesting for our freedom right now. That's the difference. What's the purpose of storming Congress? How do I know that? They reached and entered the Speaker's office itself although Nancy Pelosi and other lawmakers had already been evacuated to safety. Here you go. Here you go, brother. As we filmed, protesters tore down Pelosi's nameplate. And so here we are right now inside the halls of Congress. This is exactly what so many anticipated. And yet the Capitol Hill police are doing their best, but failing to control the situation. Robert Moore... Welcome to this conversation. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you, uh, uh, David. Very nice to join you. And thanks to all the people who have made this possible, but also, of course, to the, the memory of, of John Schofield, who uh, many of us knew and, uh, and admired. And, uh, you know, any of us who can uh, help his, the mission of the Trust uh, to mentor young journalists, a group we need more than ever now, that I, I'm just delighted to help. Thank you. Robert, what do you think uh, watching those scenes again? You must have watched them many times in the edit, but now as a few weeks have passed, what do you think? Well, I think it's a, it's a glimpse, isn't it? It's no more than that. We're only trying to sort of put together one piece of, of, a, of a very complicated jigsaw of American politics in kind of extraordinary turmoil and transition. And that was just one glimpse of the fury of one side. Um, so, you know, I think it's important that, you know, we don't think, okay, so this is America, uh, on the brink of civil war. There's obviously, you know, many people, tens of millions of Americans who are not part of this partisan divide, who are actually sitting in the middle uh, of American politics, looking for a sort of a centrist way forward. But, but what I take away from that, what I did at the time, and, and even more so now, is the fury um, and the, the deep-seated grievances of Trump supporters, who are a huge number of people, you know, more than 70 million people voted for Donald Trump, even though they had a, you know, four year understanding of what his presidency was all about. And those who are the most vocal amongst his supporters, you know, do believe very profoundly and very, very viscerally, as you saw in that report, that this election was stolen and those grievances are not going to go anywhere. And that anger, you know, has dispersed, but it, but in some ways it hasn't dissipated. And I think that's the story that is still to be told for us 
now is where does that anger go? Because it hasn't gone away. Those people are still convinced the election was stolen and they still believe that, that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president. So, um, you know, for me, when I look back at that, it raises more questions about where journalism in America goes next. You know, that was a moment, it was just a glimpse, but, but it raises actually um, really interesting questions about how we cover America are going forward. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I think we'll get a chance to come to those, but could, you, could we start off just by maybe talking through the events of that day as you covered it? And we should say you were there with your producer, Sophie Alexander, and your, your cameraman, Mark Davey, but when you were planning the coverage that day, did any of you think that it was going to end up the way it did, that you were going to end up in the Capitol Hall itself with the protesters having penetrated the building? It's a good question, uh, David. Thank you for asking that. In a strange way, I mean, I've never used the word luck for what we did that day because it's actually, we had worked pretty hard uh, for a number of months of understanding where the sort of uh, the stream of consciousness in the sort of white supremacist and militia movements were, were going. And I first heard that the pre-inauguration days would be tumultuous. Uh, uh, back in September of 2020, when I went down to Louisville in Kentucky and did some stories on the militia movements there. And I spoke to a number of people who said to me, look, uh, we can accept a defeat in November because they're going to steal it from us. But what we cannot accept is the inauguration of Joe Biden as president. And they'd said to me, what is, what is to watch is the days immediately preceding uh, inauguration. In other words, watch carefully the certification process, not the election. Um, and so I kind of went into that first week of, of January genuinely alarmed about what might happen, um, aware that the certification would happen on the 6th. And on the 5th, I'd actually done some news gathering down in Washington, D.C. and spoken to a large number of, of people who would also be there the following day. And they had warned me uh, explicitly, look, we won't accept the certification tomorrow. Uh, the mood will be angry and ugly. And I'd realized then that it was likely to come to a sort of a violent climax. What I couldn't know was that it would be a simultaneous um, failure of, of law enforcement on, a, on an extraordinary scale. So I knew there would be pockets of violence. I knew there would be the deep fury I'd encountered for some weeks. But what I didn't know is that would marry itself to what was clearly a massive intelligence failure. And then on top of that, a law enforcement failure to hold the perimeter of Congress. And it, it, that moment at about 2.15 p.m., on January the 6th in some ways was the kind of perfect storm of what we knew was going to happen and then what we couldn't anticipate which was the the colossal intelligence and policing failure around the capital complex itself. So your expectation was that most of your coverage would be to the exterior of that building but the idea that we're going to get in really was you couldn't have foreseen that. Exactly it, it, what I expected to be doing that day was probably what I'd been doing in June on the other side of the ideological divide during the BLM protests outside the White House. I expected there to be angry scuffles, uh, tear gas fired, you know, pepper spray used, uh, you know, remarkable scenes back in June outside the White House. And I expected that to be replicated outside the Capitol building. Um, but just like the Secret Service held the White House perimeter with the help of the National Guard in, in those extraordinary days in June and July, I expected the Capitol Hill police to hold the Capitol Hill uh, line and perimeter in early January. What I didn't expect was that, was, was that line of, of protection to collapse quite as dramatically as it did. And of course, many people made the comparison between the, the heavy handedness of the Black Lives Matter uh, policing and apparently the, 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 the weakness or the chaos which allowed the, the crowd in. What, what is your feeling about the way the Capitol Police played it that today? Because many people were saying, why didn't they have their, have their guns out? Why weren't, they, uh, why weren't they trying to hold the line? What would have happened if they had, do you think? Really good, a really interesting avenue to explore that, David, and, and a good question. I have a slightly contrarian view of this, which is this, that we've all summer long, we, 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 we were rightfully outraged uh, by the conduct of uh, Washington DC's police force and the National Guard in how aggressively they policed the BLM activities, you know, how they broke it up, how they used their batons and tear gas and pepper spray uh, on people. Um, and we had complained vociferously about that because it was 
it was absurd given the, the level of the threat. So if you move that forward to how we think, or you know, how an objective observer might observe the events of January the 6th, it raises the question, would we, want, would we have wanted, or would we have thought appropriate, and would we have judged appropriate that the Capitol Hill police officers had used similarly aggressive tactics against the Trump supporters? I mean, if they had done so, and pulled their weapons out and maybe opened fire with live rounds, obviously dozens of people would have died. And in the end, what they decided to do was, was to let their perimeter basically evaporate and to let the crowd into the building. And I'm not persuaded that that was a poor judgment, even though there is now this kind of capital um, and Senate and House investigation. It seems to me that actually, the only person who died in the building that day was a protester shot by a law enforcement agent. Um, no protesters were killed at that moment. Some two police officers later committed suicide uh, and one was, was wounded and, and died in circumstances that are still not entirely clear. But the question I kind of ask is, you know, are we right to rush to judgment that this was a, a massive failure of policing when actually maybe the alternative would have been a bloodbath on the steps of the Capitol. So it's an open question, but uh, you know, I don't think we can on the one hand attack the uh, law enforcement for aggressively um, taking down BLM protesters uh, in June and then complain also that they were too lenient in January. We're getting a lot of questions then about your safety and the safety of your crew when you were filming this. Um, was there ever a moment when you thought, wow, these guys could turn on us? Sure, I mean, um, that's an issue. I mean, look, as Sophie Alexander has pointed out, you know, we, walk, we walked into that building, you know, next to a sign saying murder the media. Uh, it was clear that, you know, the target of these Trump supporters is kind of twofold. You know, obviously their main grievances with the senators and the members of the House of Representatives who are certifying the election result, but their kind of parallel target, if you like, is what they regard as the mainstream media and they regard the two is kind of complicit in a kind of establishment cover up and theft of the election. So sure, there was animosity towards us um, and anger, but it never struck me um, that we, our lives were in peril. I thought, sure, we might get sort of, um, we might get hit, uh, we might get involved in a scuffle. Um, and I was also concerned about the COVID risks, given that it was a large crowd of Trump supporters who famously, you know, are skeptical of mask wearing and so have a presumably a higher proportion of COVID carrying uh, members. So there were, there, were, there were concerns, but in the end, you know, we just went with the flow uh, and decided to turn this into a piece of eyewitness reporting um, and, and use skills that we've learned on the road for some time over many years of covering conflict situations about how to try and stay safe, you know, to trying to make sure that, um, first of all, that we we uh, were identified as non-American journalists. So we, I was constantly telling people around me that we were a British news crew. Um, you know, as been reported elsewhere, Mark Davy was, you know, often telling people he's from Ireland and, you know, he, he had, uh, had no particular dog in, in this fight either. So we were trying to project ourselves as both kind of eyewitness, uh, an eyewitness news crew, but also not, no, but not somebody who was, could in any way be identified with the certification of the result or with the kind of associated anger of the in the election aftermath. So it's a long way of saying that we 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 took a calculated and calibrated risk. And, uh, you know, that's, of course, what news crews do all over the world. And I didn't regard that risk as excessive in any way. That I was just thinking about that scene that we saw where you're basically being jostled back and forward and you have people shouting at you. Did you do you think that by being there, in any way you changed what happened in terms of people's behavior or were you as you say just going with the flow filming what was happening anyway no i don't think we did change the dynamic the crowd dynamic was um was really uh, charged as you know um and these people you know several people stopped to talk to us you know the, we were jostled one guy came at us with a flagpole with some kind of improvised spear on it but but you know in the end what was really noticeable was that you know it may seem extraordinary given the amount of coverage we've given to Donald Trump over the last four years but they did genuinely felt disenfranchised they felt their voice hadn't been heard um, so when they realized we were filming as you'll have seen in the report many of them turned to our camera 
and were, were talking directly down the barrel of the camera, wanting us to be a kind of a platform. Um, I'm not sure if they believed we were live streaming or if we were a news crew. I don't think you know, anybody was quite analyzing that. But there was almost a, a sense that, um, OK, this is a news crew here, the only one that apparently is filming us, and we want to get our message across. So I don't think we changed the dynamic, but we did provide kind of a, a megaphone for them, if you like. Yeah. I think we should talk about what has led to this moment. And I mean, you've been reporting America for, uh, for many years. Um, it's a huge question. How have things reached this, this stage? How has American society so split that there seems to be no common ground uh, between uh, liberals and conservatives, that it doesn't even seem as though they're looking at the same reality and disagreeing about it, but effectively they are seeing two different versions of reality. And a country which prides itself as a cradle of democracy um, and, of, and of freedom um, now is in a situation where a large percentage of its population genuinely believe that an election conducted according to every independent observer fairly with you know, certainly no sign of massive uh, vote stealing is an illegitimate election. How, how has America reached this stage? Yeah, as you as you kind of anticipate, that's a that's a complicated and, and big question. I mean, I'll, I'll just point to a couple of kind of kind of, of factors. I mean, firstly, you know, Donald Trump was a master of of um, of culture wars and of deepening uh, divisions. Uh, you know, he saw a schism and exploited it, but that schism was already there, and I think it's been amplified uh, by the media uh, sort of infrastructure ecosystem that exists here because. Uh, you know, the cable news networks in particular, you know, are remarkably uh, partisan here in a way that, you know, any British viewer just would not recognize. And in fact, even veterans of American politics are startled uh, when they come here from the UK at just what sort of space it's in now. I remember my old friend Matt Fry came over here for the election. Now he's reported on America for many, many years, but he, he was stunned by the sort of the venom on the on the 24 hour news talk shows when he arrived here to cover the 2020 election, saying it had reached a place that he'd never seen before in which CNN was also, you know, heavily invested, it seemed, in, uh, in a Biden victory. And of course, Fox News, you know, felt heavily invested in catering to a, a sort of a, an audience of the American right. So um, there is this kind of uh, sense that there are two echo chambers in the American media and then of course if you look at social media that's even more extreme in which you know everybody is uh going to their favorite platforms and their algorithms are triggering uh content that further deepens their belief so if you, you know if you're putting in QAnon conspiracy theories into your search engine quite often you're going to get additional conspiratorial content so in a way what we've got here is kind of the politics of the Trump era, combining with a media ecosystem that is partisan, and then big tech that is, and, and its algorithms that are furthering the divide. So, you know, I think it is accurate to call it a perfect storm. And, you know, Joe Biden can talk, uh, as he did in his inaugural address uh, here on Capitol Hill on January the 20th about unifying America, but that task isn't gonna be possible unless uh, some of the causes of the polarization are addressed. And that doesn't just mean in the political sphere, but also in social media, uh, as well as in broadcast media. One of our previous guests in this masterclass series was Dorothy Byrne of Channel 4. And she said in our masterclass a few weeks ago that, you know, a generation ago, Ronald Reagan removed the responsibility for even handedness in public broadcasting. And she traced the events of the Capitol riots right back to that moment where you abandon the desire for impartiality, you create a situation where there are parallel versions of reality and the effect it has on your civic society is it really tears it apart. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think, you, you know, arguably you could date it uh, even earlier than that, but certainly uh, that Reagan era uh, decision uh, not to require kind of impartiality was a key moment in the journey to where uh, the 24 hour news networks are in America. So yes, I think I think that's a I think Dorothy Dorothy is right in that respect. But you know, it, it is, you know, the, the question of our age for journalists, because we don't want um, the broadcast media to be an establishment stitch up either. You know, we want new entries, we want competition, we want people coming up with unorthodox views and 
anti-establishment views. Um, and not every conspiracy theory is wrong, of course. You know, the world is full of conspiracies, uh, genuine conspiracies. Um, and so we don't want to, every time somebody's investigating an outlandish theory for it to be ridiculed as going down a kind of anti-establishment route. We need to be open, um, not opaque. And so I think it's a question that, that is fundamental to kind of Ofcom and to all of those, you know, journalists entering British TV news currently is, you know, how do we maintain integrity and credibility, but not close ourselves off to um, a world of skepticism and inquiry and fierce investigation that we desperately need. So, you know, there are no easy answers. If, if there were, we wouldn't have been consumed by this question for, for a decade, but certainly this question is coming to British television screens uh, with a significance and a vitality that we haven't seen before with new entries uh, coming into British broadcasting system. So, um, you know, they, you might have a view on this, David, as well. But, but certainly, it's it's a it's a big question that all of us need to grapple with. I wonder too, Robert, what you think of the way that the British media has covered the Trump presidency. I don't know if you saw John Sopel today saying that um, turning from the Trump presidency to the Biden presidency was like spending four years on crack cocaine and then settling down with a glass of shandy. Um, and I worked in the the BBC's Washington bureau. Uh, in 2009, the very beginning of the Obama presidency. And even if you ignore the content, if you just look at the tone uh, of the way in which British media has covered the Obama presidency and then uh, the, the Trump presidency, there has been a lot of eye rolling. There has been a lot of nose holding. There has been a lot of kind of, why these crazy Americans about it? And I just wonder what, what you feel about that um, in terms of the British media's coverage of this. Yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? I mean, look, John is a, is a good friend of mine. I'm, I'm a huge fan of his journalism. Um, and so I think, you know, the comment I'm going to make is, is regarding all of us, you know, and I look in the mirror too uh, and ask this question, is whether we have a slightly patronizing view of American politics, whether what, what you call the sort of the nose holding, whether we come here uh, with our kind of uh, cultural understanding of what TV news is all about uh, and pass our, ju our judgment on what is the kind of raucous uh, circus that is 24-hour uh, news channel journalism in America. And I, you know, it's probably right to say we shouldn't make a judgment. I mean, we can report on it and see it, but you know, I think what, what I wanted to capture on January the 6th, and indeed what you know, ITV News has wanted to capture in America for four years now throughout the Trump presidency, is not to pass judgment on, on the Trump era, um, I'm not sure it's for us to make that judgment, but really to, to hear the voices of, of Trump's base, you know, his core supporters, you know, they have got incredibly strongly held grievances. Um, and I think it's entirely legitimate that we listen to them without passing instant judgment. Um, and one of the questions we can discuss, and it may be questions people have is, you know, what level, when do we apply kind of judgment? I mean, if somebody has a QAnon theory, about the direction of America, do we then ridicule it or, or by implication ridicule it? Or do we, are we equally happy broadcasting QAnon theorists and um, other theories that are attached to the kind of the darker side of the Trump era? And I don't think there are any easy answers, but I do share your view slightly that for all of us broadcasting in America, but who have kind of a British television news heritage, uh, there is a danger of us kind of being a bit judgmental, a bit patronizing, a bit kind of even superior in how we view uh, developments in American politics. And I think we need to be careful to um, make sure that we, we're not too judgmental. Do you think that you'll still be in DC covering the 2024 election? Well, look, I'm, I'm here for a while. I'm not, I've now handed over the, the bureau to Emma Murphy, an outstanding uh, reporter who's come over here to be the bureau correspondent, but I'm staying involved as an ITV news reporter here in, in Washington and the US. I'm doing some longer form current affairs reporting as well. So sure, I'll be here, I think, for, for several more years um, and we'll stay involved in journalism and do all I can to kind of be an ambassador for ITV News uh, and for how we cover America. And, it, you know, and um, I'm really proud of the team we have in, in the Washington Bureau. But also, you know, this is a point that's not kind of very fashionable to thank bosses and so on, but, but also to, to be grateful for the incredible support we've had from both the ITV News Foreign Desk and from our 
from our editors in particular, you know, Andrew Dagnall and Rachel Corp, who, who have given us the freedom here to do our own journalism. And, and, you know, I spoke about how I first glimpsed what happened on January the 6th, actually back in early September. That's because I rang up the desk and said to them, look, I want to go over to Louisville. The, the militia there are breaking cover. I want to go and talk to them. And I got a one word answer, go. And that's the kind of, you know, they weren't worried about anything else, missing other stories, you know, where journalists on the front line or in, in a bureau want to do something that might provide, you know, light and a glimpse into what's happening. You know, the ITV news culture has always been to go and to travel to news gather. That's where, that's where we've been most successful. And that's where the kind of heritage of ITV news uh, remains very strong. So the, the reason I was asking you about 2024 was, um, and I guess we can say now that the Republican candidate will certainly be Trumpian, but, uh, you know, do you think he'll be Trump? I think there's a strong possibility. He still completely controls uh, the Republican Party uh, from outside currently. Um, and we'll have to wait several years before we decide if he's, if he's a candidate. But, you know, the problem with the Trump years is, as it's shown every single potential nascent presidential candidate how to run a populist, a hyper-aggressive, nativist, xenophobic campaign. I mean, the secret is out there now. You know, you can, you can appeal to people's uh, basest instincts, particularly over immigration and the southern border. Uh, and there will be kind of a strong uh, reaction to that. It's a way, if not to win a presidential election, certainly to win the Republican primary, where the kind of coarse Republican voter is most active. So it's very difficult to see how a centrist, moderate, moderate Republican Party can be revived at the moment. And we saw that down in Orlando just a few days ago at that meeting of the of CPAC, the conservative wing of the party, which is clearly uh, in Trump's hands still. And I guess once you have a 78 year old in the White House, no one can say, sorry, Mr. Trump, you're too old. Exactly. No, that's true. And of course, uh, Trump in four years will be 78. So he'll be the same age as as Joe Biden, who may be running himself for a second term at the age of 82. So, you know, there's another issue about gerontocracy, gerontocracy, yeah. gerontocracy in American politics, because if you look at Nancy Pelosi, who's 80, you look at Joe Biden, who's 78. You look at Mitch McConnell, who's you know, also 77 or 78, you know, um, and Donald Trump, who's 74, 75. You know, you look at a pretty old generation of American leaders and you wonder where, where the new generation is coming from and where they've got where they've gone. And that's a, another big question for American politics is why there are not more, you know, we saw the Pete Buttigieg candidacy as kind of an incredibly young kind of dynamic candidate, but, but why did they not break through? And it may be to, to cut through all of this, it does require another sort of uh, strong young candidate to, to energize American politics and to take it back into the center ground where you would think it might, might belong. And do you, I'm not asking you to, to take out your crystal ball, but do, a series of um, legal actions stacking up around Trump, uh, rumors of enormous debts, you don't, you don't see any of that um, quelling, his, uh, quelling his potential as a future candidate for president? No, I don't. I think he's, you know, he, he's been surrounded by legal questions all of his life, by you know, ethical issues. Uh, questions of nepotism, you know, have besieged him for, for, for years now, and, and he escapes every time. And in some ways, in a bizarre sort of counterintuitive way, it almost validates him and validates his supporters as this is being a, a, a kind of an establishment stitch up, you know, what he has cleverly called the swamp. And so if he can run against the swamp, if he can say, look, you know, the, whether it's a Southern District of New York and their prosecutors, whether it's CNN and MSNBC, whether it's a uh, big tech, you know, all of these forces are trying to destroy me that, that that's not a negative for him that's a positive that builds him up it doesn't take him down and i think that's how he's always run his his kind of presidency and how he'll run his campaign if it emerges in 2024 well you can tell that our um, participants tonight are all journalists because they've been giving me some very detailed journalistic questions about your <laughs> about your process i'm going to come to those before i say that i should say we've got more than 200 people with us tonight, mostly in the UK, but uh, a lot in North America. Um, we've got some people in the Middle East. We've got some people in Europe. So it's a it's a great uh, a great showing. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, so I've got a question here from Richard Tudor, and Richard says, "How did you approach writing the voiceover when you had such powerful historical pictures to write to?" Good question, uh, Richard. And, and you know. Uh, it sounds, you know, I would love to have had another go at doing that package in some ways because, you know, I ran back to the Bureau. It was about uh, 3.15, 3.20 uh, 
in, in the afternoon. So I had like an hour, an hour to edit the, 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 the report we did. Uh, and as a little sort of technical note of frustration, uh, the, the two kind of cards we had the content on didn't format properly. So when we put them into our edit machine, uh, far from being in a sequence, they came in, in as a jumble of, of like 100, 115 different sets of images. So the edit, let me just tell you, was uh, not without its stresses. And, uh, you know, we, we would um, always like, as we do in this profession, to have had a, another go at it. But, but I think, you know, the, the thought that, that is at the heart of what ITV News does, but also is a long tradition of everybody in British television news, and I think it's one of our great strengths, is, is to, you know, when we have remarkable picture and audio, in that case, we had both, uh, to let it run and not to kind of, as I've said before, not to kind of over report or over analyze it, but to let the pictures tell the story and, and where we can let a, a television news viewer be kind of just in the, in that moment, in that corridor in the Senate or in the crypt of, of the House of Representatives, let, just take them there and leave them there. It doesn't need me to analyze it. You know, that they can, these, these insurrectionists or rioters, whatever you want to call them, um, you know, they can, they can speak more eloquently for themselves and their cause than, than I can. So all I could try and do was give it just a little bit of context, you know, uh, what exactly was their grievance? When did they go in? Uh, why was there a failure of, of policing? But really the story told itself. So in some ways, as often with a big story, uh, it was the easiest story in the world to tell and much more difficult is some pedestrian story, you know, we might do on a Friday lunchtime or something that it, that it requires uh, a bit more, um, care because we don't have strong pictures. So in a way, um, I think the, you know, the journalistic lesson in all of this is the bigger and the more visceral the story, then the easier it is to write. And, and you just have to try and remember not to write too much or to overanalyze it because the story essentially tells itself. And when you were there, did you have any sense of where the other news crews were? I mean, because while you were being jostled on the, on the floor there, the BBC was locked in the basement, wasn't it? Yeah. So, um, yeah, a strange set of circumstances. So we were acutely aware that we were only we were the only television news camera um, with the kind of the group of protesters that actually went in and over the threshold of, of the Capitol because we could see around us. There were a few activists who were live streaming um, and we could see that, but there didn't seem to be any other news crews there. Um, and so, you know, we realized we had remarkable picture and there was a sense that, you know, because of the the chant and, and the sense of a sort of frenzy within the crowd, it was apparent that this was, you know, not just a strong story, but potentially an historic story uh, and an important one to tell. Um, but you're right, uh, David, there was no way of knowing where other crews were. We always assumed as we walked down the corridors and down into the crypt and up to Nancy Pelosi's office, there were other crews working el elsewhere in the building. And, and there were uh, some other TV crews working. But what we kind of uniquely captured was, was the kind of the, the moment of when when the crowd crossed the threshold and actually kind of physically entered uh, the capital complex and then we just sort of naturally followed them through but it was only much later in the day that it, it re we realized that actually you know other people had had less success you know some people were doing uh you know live shots for their programs um others were you know locked in a basement or were doing other broadcast commitments. So, you know, we, we had that uh, good fortune, it is fair to say. Um, but, um, you know, there's humility in this business too, David, as you know, I mean, we're not, you know, that, that was a successful story for me personally and, and for ITV News, but, but, you know, I'll get scooped by John, you know, uh, tomorrow or by Cordelia Lynch or, you know, the Sky guys who are outstanding as well, you know, next week. So, you know, we all, you know, hope hope for the best when we do our stories, but there's no sense of um, of sort of gloating on this one at all. I mean, um, I, I know how strong the BBC journalism is here in North America. I'm also, you know, huge fans of Sky News and stuff and Channel 4 News. So what is good about British journalism here is we're all, you know, although we're competitive, we're also have a sort of a, a good friendship going and we're colleagues and comrades and, and you know, we want to make sure we're, we're all safe and, and able to tackle the next story down the road. Do you know how many people around the world saw your report, Robert? Well, I don't, but obviously, you know, it, it did go viral because um, nobody else perhaps captured that moment of crossing the threshold and and some of the reactions from some of those insurrectionists to our down, down the camera, particularly um, a character called David Medina, who, you know, looked at us and said, you know, we were good law abiding citizens. Uh, you know, the government did this to us. And then he looked at us down the camera and said, no, you did this to us. 
and it realized then that, that it kind of we were you know for him this was a kind of a coalescing of uh, anger with the government anger with the senate with the house with the media it all come together for him into this one moment at like 235 on that on that day uh, he he'd broken through and suddenly you know we were the the target of his anger but also of his deep political and ideological frustrations i guess yeah and do you have any feeling as to what would have happened if they had managed to get hold of nancy pelosi mike pence i mean would it have been as bad as as many people fear it would yeah, it's. I think that's a. It's a question that you know. Uh, so that I'm sure the FBI is, is thinking about. Um, I mean, the truth is, we didn't see any firearms on with with insurrectionists. So we, you know, the guy next to me had a baseball bat. The people had sort of improvised spears and flagpoles. So you know, there, there was a menace within the crowd and, and a kind of a perhaps a violent intent that was unmistakable. But it didn't appear to me that we were on the brink of a kind of a massacre. You know, it's not clear to me that anybody was. Was was had you know long arms or, or a pistol on them. I didn't see any of that, um, and um, and I was looking. You know, I was looking because I was kind of trying to assess the the risk to ourselves. I was looking carefully at whether people, you know, might have uh, the bulge of a firearm under their jacket or what was in people's backpacks. I saw no firearms that day whatsoever. So there is the question, uh, which is an open question, and we will follow it closely when the as the FBI and the court cases go through. Or whether there is a danger now of the sort of liberal criminal justice system, if you like, overreacting and now regarding these people as, as Joe Biden has called them, as domestic terrorists. I mean, were they really terrorists? Was their intention uh, violent and grievance related, or was it more than that? Was it terror related? And it's easy now to say, look, okay, Joe Biden is calling them domestic terrorists. That's what the FBI is calling them. That's what Christopher Ray called them, uh, the director of the FBI, when he gave evidence on the Hill just. Uh, 24 hours ago, but are they terrorists? Is that a term that journalists are comfortable using? Um, and I think that's again very open to debate. And well, that's very interesting to hear you say that because, of course, you know you know the reaction uh, here w was largely these guys are uh, anti -de anti democratic, they're uh, white supremacists, they're white terrorists, um, they want to overthrow the elected government, um, and you were there, you were being shouted at by them and jostled by them and and you are very very measured about this yeah i'm very skeptical of a description calling them domestic terrorists i mean uh because first of all look how many of them were there there were a thousand people now i went in there with a couple a couple who who uh joined them and were primarily there when they got through there i had the I'm not sure we actually filmed it, but we actually did film some of it. But but they were taking pictures of the sculptures and the paintings inside the Capitol. I mean, the irony was that they were in that mob, but they were so in awe of what they were seeing and of the majesty of the Capitol building that they actually kind of defaulted us into kind of Washington tourists. I mean, it was so let's just be a little bit nuanced about how we describe this group of a thousand people. I mean, some undoubtedly, you know, um, had violent intentions and I'm not disguising that at all. But what happened to the crowd who, the small group, maybe 10, 15 people who went into the well of the chamber? What did they do? Did they destroy the chamber? Or did they just sit down and ruffle through some paper, rustle through some paper, and in the end, have a reasonably amenable conversation with the one police officer in the Senate chamber, and eventually he persuaded them to leave? Um, and actually, one of them wrote a note for Mike Pence and, uh, at, at the, on the podium. I mean, so, it, the question is an open one. Are, do, you know, are they terrorists? Are they white supremacists? Are they Trump loyalists with just deep-seated grievances? Are they just rioters? It, was it a mob? You know, all of these are questions, and I don't think it's you know certainly for me who was there and right amid them, you know, in that crowd, I'm not, I'm not finding it comfortable to describe them as domestic terrorists or even as necessarily as as white supremacists. Uh, you know, I think you need to drill down and see what exactly their individual motives were, because as I saw it, it was a coalition of grievances and not all were violent and not all were white supremacists and not all were, were wanting to do deep, uh, you know, physical harm to Mike Pence or Nancy Pelosi. So I just think, you know, as always with journalism, perhaps, David, the, the, the point is not to rush to judgment. And I think maybe uh, it also speaks to the rather curious place that the Capitol Hill complex is, because on the one hand, it is a palace of democracy. 
Uh, and on the other, it's a public space that you can wander in. And the contrast with Westminster is very clear. I mean, Westminster, you wander around Westminster up Whitehall. It's a security state. There are thick, you know, there's guys with submachine guns and there's, there's thick concrete bollards to stop anything happening. That's not the case on Capitol Hill. It is a really good point, isn't it? And, and those who have worked in sort of in Westminster, in the Palace of Westminster, <coughs> excuse me, and in the Capitol, I mean, always make that observation. Whereas, you know, people cannot wander around the Palace of Westminster without uh, passes and accreditation. But here, there is this sense, and we heard that chant, didn't we? Whose house? Our house. This is our house. And, and that is this sense amongst the American people, which is a deep cultural one, that, you know, this, these are the people's representatives. And that actually a, a pretty high percentage of people who entered the building, even if they did so illegally, and obviously, you know, through broken windows and, and doors, which they'd forced open, nevertheless had a sense, um, rightly or wrongly, that this was kind of their real estate, that they, they, were, they were on their territory, that what have we done that's wrong? You know, this is our house. And, and I think therefore, you know, we can of course make the obvious observation that they broke in and therefore they'd committed an e illegal act. But there is that, uh, David, a very smart observation of yours. There is this kind of um, disconnect between how Brits view Westminster, the Palace of Westminster, and how Americans view Capitol Hill and, and the Senate and the House. I mean, they have a, a strong sense of ownership of it. And, um, and that definitely played into why that crowd went in there. Here's a good question. Jack Parker asks, how do you suggest a young UK-based broadcast journalist can get into reporting US politics and, affair and current affairs? Is there a right way of getting your foot in the door? Well, that's a really good question, isn't it? Um, I think there's a whole uh, breed of, of young journalists here now who are doing something quite uh, impressive um, uh, and notable, which is they're trying to understand the sort of protest um, impulses underway in America. And quite often, you know, when you get to a, an event now, there are people live streaming um, uh, protests and rallies uh, all over America. And, and some are independent journalists who have said, look, okay, you know, here is a major story, the sort of fragmentation of American politics and the polarization of it. How do we best report it? And quite a few people are reaching the conclusion that a good way to do that is actually just to be physically there to film it to live stream it or to blog on it um, and to just to, to be present. In other words, to be kind of eyewitnesses to what's happening here. And that's always, it seems to me, is a good way to, to do things is to, is to place your somewhere, yourself somewhere where something fascinating, something that you find personally interesting is playing out and, and to be uh, eyewitnesses and, and to, to live stream from there and to get you know, a journalistic reputation as someone who is prepared to, to cover kind of the, you know, the, the shifting tectonic plates in America. So, you know, it might be uh, to track, you know, the Proud Boys or, or BLM or Antifa or any of these kind of myriad groups that are throwing up really interesting journalistic challenges for us. And so I'd recommend to anybody, you know, is to, to be there. You know, you can't, you can't kind of be a journalist if you're not an eyewitness, I would say. A great question has come in from Amy Sutton. Robert, what would you say are the main challenges you face reporting and working from a bureau with News at 10 team in a different time zone? Yeah, good question. I mean, look, so we broadcast uh, our programs. You know, so the evening news goes out at 1.30 in the afternoon here. That's 6.30 in the UK. And obviously News at 10 goes out at, at 5 p.m. Um, I mean, apart from the fact that it is the greatest time zone on the planet if you have a family because um, I get home at six and uh, my bosses are asleep by 7 p.m. Eastern Coast time. So I never, almost never get disturbed uh, by phone calls after 7 p.m., which is one of the, the glories and, and the sort of secrets of working in on the East Coast of the United States is your bosses are asleep uh, while you're reading bedtime stories to your kids. So that's all pretty good news. Um, but yeah, it, it does present a sort of logistical challenge, which is that, you know, you haven't got all of your working day. So, you know, by two or three in the afternoon, uh, you need to be back in the bureau with your story if you're going to edit it successfully for News at 10. And if you're working on the West Coast, that's even more acute because your News at 10 is going out at 2 p.m. And therefore, you know, you have to be thinking about having news gathered the previous night and potentially having, you know, starting editing at 10 in the morning uh, for News at 10. So, yeah, it, it's always a factor. You have to bear it in mind. But, um, 
but there are more inhospitable time zones. You know, if you work in China or somewhere, then you know you really are working through the night. So I'm not one to complain about time zones, uh, certainly if you have a family here. And, and going back to your observation uh, in in your answer to uh, to Jack about sort of getting in there and and filming and blogging and all the rest of it. Uh, and we saw everyone with their cell phones filming as they, they, they were there with you in the capital. And of course, a lot of them are doing that because they're trying to check the mainstream media, aren't they? They're trying to, they're trying to confirm that what the mainstream media says is true. And I'm sure you must have had reaction to that incredible footage that we saw earlier where people say, I don't believe it. I don't believe that's what happened. I, those, those guys were Antifa guys. They weren't Trump guys at all. Well, I mean, in a world of disinformation, how does the how as a journalist do you respond to that? Should you should you get involved? Should you respond, or should you let your work talk for itself? Well, I think I mean the latter is, is the better strategy. I think I mean uh, you know these conspiracy theories are, are pretty uh, deeply entrenched, and um, you know we're not therapists. We can't help people who think that. Um, you know that Antifa was there on the day it's pretty clear to me they weren't um there's no evidence that they were you know I actually personally know some of the some of the rioters because I'd met them the previous day so you know I was in a rare position of being able to validate their ideological orientation because I'd actually met them covering the story and the build-up to the riot so you know I was seeing people who I kind of recognized from uh from the crowd the previous day so I knew that you know they weren't from the left, even though there is obviously that conspiracy theory that the whole thing was a false flag operation and it was the left that had launched it in order to discredit uh, the political right. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, don't think that journalists can get necessarily in that space. I think it's better for us to, to tell our journalism, but also to fiercely be protective of our, of our integrity. And, and, and that's why, you know, um, the BBC and Sky and ITV News are in are in good shape here because we've all got kind of reputations, uh, strong reputations for independent um, and ethical journalism. And so, you know, we can we can stand on the shoulders of our kind of newsroom cultures, if you like. And what we say, I think, you know, does resonate with our television news audiences in Britain because uh, I don't think, you know, I mean, there may be accusations from some, but, you know, we are reporting what we see to the best of our ability without any kind of um, deep, uh, ideological orientation you know I, I don't I'm, I'm trying to be I'm not sympathetic to the rioters and the insurrectionists of that day but but to uh, uh, listen to them uh, you know it, it sounds old-fashioned isn't it but our business is essentially about listening uh, and, and and a little bit of humility and not always trying to judge um, and not always trying to to decide you know who is right and who is wrong uh, and but just to listen and to report and to if a situation is as complicated and as fluid as that, essentially to default to eyewitness reporting and just show what happened. Now you said that you, you know, you're not into psychologizing people who believe in conspiracy theories. Um, a lot of people have um, psychologized uh, former President Trump uh, and have questioned you know, his, his fitness for, for office. Um, the American people have given their view on that. But I just wondered what your view was. I mean, what we do know is that um, Trump was a figure who, who used disinformation or lies um, tactically as a kind of battering ram, as an attempt to, to up the ante as an aggressive tactic. What's your view on his, his use of incorrect information? Was it tactical, strategic? Did he believe it? What, what's your observation on it? You must have seen a lot of it in his public speeches and interviews. Yeah, no, I think he used it tactically um, and for his political advantage. I think he exploited it. I mean, I don't think, he, you know, he may, he may believe some of it, but um, I don't think he believes a great deal of it. Um, I think he's using it and leveraging it uh, as sort of fodder for his core supporters. Um, and I think we saw that, you know, I mean, he doesn't believe, I don't think for a moment, that his inaugural crowd size was bigger than Barack Obama's. I mean, but he was taunting us. He was uh, provoking us. He was opening up a kind of informational warfare space, if you like, in that opening day of his presidency. That was what was so startling, is the presidency began on the most bizarre lie of all. Um, uh, it was done to was, disorient, to disorientate. Exactly. I mean, it was so it was so obviously false that it had value to him because he was testing the waters. You know, can he could he make something? 
as outlandish as that. You know, we could see there were vast spaces of the mall and the Pennsylvania Avenue that were empty, you know, rewind eight years earlier, they were clearly packed. Uh, you know, it didn't need a sort of a crowd scientist to understand that that, that was just uh, palpably false. So I think, you know, even from that very first day, he was sort of taking the, the kind of informational battle to us. Um, and I think that that's something that obviously developed over the four years. And if the crowd size was the, the small lie at the beginning, then obviously the election uh, defeat was the big lie at the end. You know, this, this sense that he had won the election, even though he'd lost it. Um, this suggestion there'd been mass theft and fraud um, was the big lie. And I suppose the four years had, had led us to that moment. So yeah, I, and of course there was, you know, in the weeks preceding it, there was all the controversy of him being eliminated off uh, social media platforms like Twitter and Instagram and, and Facebook. So, I mean, there's a, tr a tremendous amount of sort of, um, of debate to be, to be had on all of those. Did Twitter make the right decision? Did Facebook make the right decision? You know, what is, what, you know, what is fair and unfair to be said on, on social media platforms that are private and, and are trying to enforce guidelines? So an extraordinary four years. I mean, storm and drang, tumultuous. As a reporter, will you will you miss the former president? Well, look, who says he's gone forever? I mean, you know, I, he's just getting ready for for the next battle. I would say, David, um, which is in part informational um, and in part political, and in part sort of for the the soul of the Republican Party. And so, I don't, you know, we'll miss him, but I don't think he's gone. So I think he's still the the, the power behind the throne, uh, he may indeed become, you know, America's 47th president, you know, he may have been the 45th and the 47th. I don't rule out that there is a sort of reaction against the sort of the Biden presidency either. Um, so, you know, he was, uh, he was a good way to keep getting on air if you're a television news reporter in, in Washington. There's no point uh, disguising that, you know, John and myself and, you know, all of those who have you know, coming to television news to, to tell a story were, were riveted by the Trump years. You know, it was a populist uh, and sort of nativist revolution, which we've never seen elsewhere. So fascinating moment, um, but not one that, uh, that necessarily has gone away for long. Because the emotional palette of the, uh, the Biden presidency, it looks very different, doesn't it? Yes, I mean, it does. And, and um, the whole sort of texture of the, of the Biden presidency, you know, it's sort of suddenly... Uh, the, the emotional temperature is, is way down and now it's about you know uh, the uh, about professionalism and about you know putting the establishment back in charge if you like and that you can regard that as a good thing or a bad thing but there's no doubt that in, in many ways what we're seeing is a, is emerging to be the Obama third term I mean many of the people who I know personally who are in Obama's uh, you know inner circle um, in, in, in his second term and now back in there in, in Biden's first term. So a lot of the figures are there. That's not to dismiss the fact there are new elements, you know, Kamala Harris, obviously one of them holding the vice presidency in an incredibly strong position to inherit Joe Biden's mantle if he doesn't go for a second term. So she isn't just a, a powerful vice president, but potentially uh, America's next president as well. So there are changing dynamics here, but obviously it, it doesn't reach the kind of emotional uh, temperature or the sort of journalistic kind of uh, uh, interest that the uh, final years of, of Trump had. I should say to people, we're still taking your questions, so please do, please do keep them coming. Um, so we started, Robert, talking about you know your uh, incredible report during the Capitol riot. Um, what does it feel like to be to think not just I'm in the middle of something historical, but also as a reporter to think. I've got this amazing stuff. What does that actually feel like? Well, I mean, I don't want to sound too disingenuous, but, um, you know, I spent 30 years on the road doing big stories, um, many times, you know, wars and, and, you know, in the case of Rwanda, a genocide. And in, in Moscow, I've, you know, I did a coup and, and you know, wildly violent uh, demonstrations across uh, many areas of the former Soviet Union. So, I mean, for me, um, you know, it's gratifying that that was a report that captured, you know, a big moment. And, um, and you know, I'm, I'm delighted that sort of ITV News has got sort of recognition for that. But, but I don't think we should ever kind of kid ourselves. You know, we are just, you know, reporters and, and a news crew. You know, there are bigger issues at stake in many of the other reports we do. And, I, you know, 
it's not false modesty to say that you know the risks I took that day were were minuscule compared to what freelancers are doing in and, and indeed you know staff correspondents and, and staff cameramen are doing in Afghanistan and Syria and, and other places and Myanmar and, and places where there is extreme danger uh, you know uh, not only of being hurt but of being imprisoned and and detained and and so on so you know I, I just wouldn't um, want to exaggerate um, the, the journalism of that day. I mean, it, it was gratifying, but um, you know, we're always cognizant that there are people taking enormous risks uh, over far bigger stories in some ways, over the life and deaths of nations and of, of people, uh, you know, all over the world. So I, I, you know, I tip my hat to to my colleagues who are taking much greater risks than I am. And we have lots of um, young journalists uh, joining us tonight. Um, Broadcast news is a profession which has changed so much in the last few years. Um, if you had the opportunity to start now, as it were, as a, as a young journalist, what, what do you think the, the, the differences would be in terms of the professional challenges that you would have to, uh, to, to deal with? That's a good question, Matt. I mean, um, in some ways, um, you know, the challenges we face, the young journalists face coming into the industry now are, are the same as they were, you know, 25 years ago. I'm not sure that even though the sort of ecosystem has, you know, changed dramatically, I'm not sure that the sort of basic ethics and the, the values of our business have changed. And, and um, you know, you can say that's because, you know, television news is kind of a heritage industry that hasn't changed with the times, or you could say because, you know, we do it well and we should be proud of it. We don't need to change it. Uh, with every sort of technical adaptation. But, uh, you know, the value of building relationships, the value of uh, being an eyewitness, as I was saying before, um, to the question about, you know, how to get involved in, in American politics, the value of, uh, of, of integrity and making sure that you have, you know, you have the ability to pitch a story honestly. Um, and I know you did a masterclass on, on pitching stories to news desks only uh, last week. Uh, so, um, you know, the same relationships you need to build within your own newsroom, but also with people you're interviewing and with political and social activists, those, those kind of core values remain the same. And I, I don't think that necessarily will ever change. I mean, what is television news journalism? It's about filming things, building relationships and telling people stories. And, you know, we might do it on Facebook, we might do it on, you know, um, on Twitter, we might do it on broadcast news, uh, we might do it on TikTok, you know, but the, the skill set strikes me as essentially the same. And perhaps it, you know, it was true for millennia before us too, is we're just trying to tell stories, uh, other people's stories with, in, in a way that where people can trust us, that, that that is an accurate sort of rendition of that story. So I, I don't think we need to kind of, people need to reinvent themselves, but rather to kind of build relationships. And I think that's was true in when I joined in the late 80s, and it's true now more than ever. Um, and I think, you know, and I think your trust does an incredible job at this, David, is, is to understand that there are, you know, the industry is wide open to uh, talent. You know, we'd recognize we need it. Um, there's never been a greater need with this, you know, fake news uh, kind of and deep fake, uh, in some cases, manipulation of video and of stories and the partisanship. You know, we're in greater need now of, of sort of young uh, blood and journalistic integrity than we ever were before to hold, you know, not just the powerful to account, but to tell people stories who otherwise have forgotten. And, and it doesn't matter what side they're on, you know, whether it's a, you know, whether it's a BLM activist or a Trump activist or whoever it is, you know, our job is to tell their stories and, 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 to, and to try and take people along with us so they get a glimpse of other people's lives. And so the technological breakthroughs, the fact that you can be out filming on your on your camera or the fact that once you've filed your story, you might have the news desk saying, you know, do, do, do us a piece for the website. That hasn't changed the character of what you're doing, has it? That, 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 that would be my argument. It's changed, you know, the, the, the rhythm of your day, 100 percent, of course, you know, my. my of course it has, you know, here we are, you know, doing a Zoom conference. I'm in, in a studio in Washington. You know, you, you guys are scattered in multiple continents. Um, and so we can talk about it in a way we couldn't have done uh, 25 years ago. But my, but my argument is that the, you know, the central sort of thrust of our business, you know, what we do and what we sell 
uh, is the same. You know, we're, we're, we're relying on integrity, we're selling stories, um, and we're building relationships. And I don't think, you know, whether it's Sandy Gall in the old days, you know, on a donkey hand, you know, walking over the and riding over the Hindu Kush mountains and with his exclusives from Afghanistan, uh, you know, when I first joined the newsroom, or, or whether it's, you know, entering the capital in January of 2021, or whether it's, you know, great work by the sky in, you know, Italian hospitals, or by, you know, Clive Murray, you know, uh, you know, telling his very personal story of, of race uh, in modern Britain, you know, all of this is essentially the same set of skills that we, we you know, that our business has been about since the very beginning. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't mean that we can't tell it in different ways with different technologies, but I'm not sure the skill sets changed at all. And I mean, I've, I've already asked you to sort of look into the future for us, which is unfair to do once. I'm going to do it again. In terms of the, this is really bouncing off a question from uh, Antoni. Uh, what does Robert think the news broadcast industry will look like in 10 years as audiences <laughs> increasingly move to online platforms with news, videos and reports taken from a multitude of outlets? Yeah, look, I, I, I'm not a good uh, sort of predictor of things. I've seen enough change to realize that um, most of the change coming our way is kind of, um, we couldn't have anticipated. Um, you know, who, who knew that my girls, you know, I've got two teenage daughters, would be getting their news primarily from TikTok, you know. Um, uh, you know, I try and orientate them towards the New York Times and, you know, and the BBC website or whatever and the ITV. They're, they're not having it. No, for some reason, they, they, this TikTok seems to have got them in the, in in its grip. I tell them that TikTok is a Chinese company. They don't seem to be too concerned about uh, the kind of country of origin of that particular platform. So, you know, I I wouldn't want to predict it, uh, given that I didn't anticipate where my daughters would be getting their news content from. Um, but look, it's fast changing. I think of the central argument, David. That, you know, I think you probably would agree with and certainly I would make is that, you know, the technology and the platforms are rapidly changing. But if the skill set of telling a story hasn't changed in a thousand years, I don't think it's going to change in the next 10, which is, you know, we need to build relationships and and, um, and just be adaptable and be on the front line of change, which is why, you know, when you ask me what I would do if I was a young journalist, I would now uh, be touring America with a live stream camera and be going to every protest and, and sort of activity I could find and, and live streaming stuff because, you know, live content is valuable. Uh, it's a glimpse for people, and um, it it allows you to to be out and and to be eyewitnesses to some you know remarkable fractures and uh, that are playing out in American politics. Robert Moore, thank you very much indeed for joining us tonight. Oh, it's a complete pleasure, and uh, we, we're looking forward to an infusion of new talent into our business. Well, I'm very grateful to you, and I'm also very grateful to everyone who joined us tonight. Thank you so much for all your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get through them all, but I'm glad we got through the ones that we can. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, and judging by the size of the numbers tonight, I think many of you are, uh, please do sign up for our newsletter. It's the best way to keep across what we're doing. Please do follow us on Twitter. Um, the John Schofield Trust does lots of uh, masterclasses throughout the year, as well as lots of other activities. It would be wonderful to, to have you on board. But uh, I'm very grateful to our guest tonight, Robert. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks now. Bye-bye, everyone.